you find that magnitude of operation comparing this to that and the literature support that is going more toward endovascular repair of these uh, procedures rather than open surgery. All right. All right. Thank yes, thank you, you Fadi. And, and um, can I just add to that? I think uh, we did consider that very carefully, Samet. But I think in this particular young man with the double aortic valve disease um, and uh, the aortic stenosis, in, in fact, well, I mean, you'll find out later, um, we felt the, the morbidity associated with thoracotomy uh, in the presence of double aortic valve disease uh, in an attempt to, to give him a more, you know, um, a surgical procedure would probably be significantly higher. Um, I think if he didn't, if we're talking just plain coarctation without... Uh, bicuspid or aortic valve problem, then maybe yes, there's, you know, one might lean a bit more towards uh, the open surgery, which like you said, the subclavian to descending aortic bypass would be quite easy or ascending to, oh. but um, in his particular case, we felt that uh, opening his chest with that valve and heart failure he was in, pericardial effusion, uh, was asking, you know, maybe we step too far. But, uh, uh, so, you know. so let me ask this question, whoever wants to answer, why should do them both at the same time? I mean, surgery, open chest and thoracotomy and fix the valve and coarctation at the same time. Um, yeah, I'm very sorry, Samer, but uh, I think the literature, there is, there is massive data demonstrated that the uh, open, open thoracic intervention is very related to uh, spinal cord ischemia and stroke. And if you compare it to endovascular treatment, I mean, no, it no, I'm is- No, I'm saying why don't do combine? I'm saying why don't do combine? And oh yeah, we, we, we spoke about that. And mm -hmm. this is the same reason we were uh, cardiac surgeons. We're feeling re very reluctant because the, if you look to the CT and we, we have not put an axial video, but the, mm -hmm. the amount of collaterals in the chest, yeah. it is impressive because this is not a, a, a 14 or 15 years old patient. He's 30 mm -hmm. years old. I mean, it is a, it's a miracle, <laughs> no? but uh, the, yes, you don't find this kind of patients. I mean, it's a miracle he's alive. Uh, yeah. It's a, you look to him. So I never have seen the 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 the, the, the internal mammary arteries were looking to SFAs. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not joking. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, I so uh, so it really it was it was impressive. So if you tell me about thoracic intervention, upper surgery. Um, and you tell me doing uh, endovascular repair, for me, it is absolutely, I mean, I have no doubt. I will no, go for it. Maybe I'll ask you this question for the fellow because I'm sure they have that in their mind. I'm just trying to think loudly for the fellow. So that when they listen to us, they know, because I'm sure some of them say, why just go with surgery? Why just do them both together? That's why I ask you this question, but I agree with you 100%. But let's see if anybody has any different opinion or everyone agree on this plan. Uh, look, everyone agree with you, Tanya. I think, right. Simon, just for the fellows, Yes. sorry, for the fellows, if I may, the answer to that question is, why would you do a joint procedure? The answer is, if you absolutely have to, um, because I think we all agree this increased morbidity um, and maybe increased mortality. Now, if you can take the view that relieving the coarctation, that the valve will give you a few months for everything to settle down, then it makes it much more compelling to stage them. But when would we have done it together is if we felt that he would not have tolerated the, the uh, reduction in afterload that came along with the coarctation. And in our case, we looked very carefully, we, we did a couple of echoes and the view that actually the aortic stenosis uh, that we were seeing the jet we were seeing was probably exaggerated in, and the valve cusp were separated. Um, and because uh, it's, the, it's the aortic stenosis you worry about more in terms of the circulatory collapse uh, rather than the regurge. Uh, the young heart, he'll manage the regurge. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the aortic stenosis, you can get into that spiral of hypotension. Um, so that was the reason why we staged it. But the answer to that question is unless you have no other choice, and the cardiologist is saying, look, he will not tolerate a reduction in afterload. And we weren't getting that message from the cardiologist. Okay. So Tanya, let us, uh, tell us what you did, Tanya. Can you finish your presentation, please? Yes, Dr. Asahra will continue. She has okay. read it. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, maybe I have to, you need to unmute yourself, Zahra. Okay, sorry. Uh, for uh, th uh, for sizing and the planning uh, pre op procedure, uh, there is uh, this is the sizes for the arteries, uh, a pre uh, procedure, and this is the three D. Planning uh, covered the left subclavian artery, carotid uh, subclavian bypass, bare cutaneous endovascular repair of the carcutation with aortic P graph 24 by 48 millimeter, measurement of, of a gradient uh, pressure through right radial artery and pigtail through a left common femoral artery. 28 2800 uh, CTAG gore as backup in case of the, uh, dissection or bleeding. So here we started the procedure. Uh, patient uh, was on subine position. We prepped the, the left side cervical area for carotid subclavian bypass. Uh, we, uh, we dissected the carotid and left subclavian artery. Unfortunately, the subclavian artery was uh, uh, fragile and uh, stitch wasn't uh, uh, stay. There was a tearing. So we couldn't do uh, the anastomosis. Uh, decided to do the ligation, uh, uh, clamping to the uh, subclavian artery, then I started the endovascular uh, procedure. So we started the endovascular uh, procedure by uh, making bilateral ultrasound gui guided a uh, bare cutaneous in the femoral artery, uh, starting with the left side, big tail, and six different sheath placed. And right side to pre close the uh, boog light uh, to upgrade the uh, 16 French uh, sheath was placed. As you, as you see here, uh, this is the big tail uh, on the uh, aortic arch measuring the pre carcutation uh, pressure. And uh, this is the another big tail measuring the post carcutation pressure. And you can see uh, the gradient between pre and post carcutation, it's more than 40 as, uh, as the pre of evaluation. Uh, also, we make sure the pressure from the aortic arch was the same from the right uh, radial artery. So for the rest of the procedure, uh, our reference was the right radial artery. After measuring the pressure, we deployed the implants on the uh, left cervical artery, as you see here. And, uh, and then we delivered uh, our take uh, B gradient stent after measuring the gradient pressure. Uh, we were uh, satisfied for the stenting. Uh, the aortic B graft stent was dilated, uh, the balloon 14 millimeter diameter between two to three pair of pressure. So uh, we completed the, the endovascular procedure by closure of the right femoral artery by proglide, but unfortunately it was failed. So we opened the, the femoral artery and they closed with a batch. On the left side, uh, only regular pressure done. We completed the subclavian procedure by uh, continuous ligation, mattress continuous uh, ligation of the subclavian artery with the uh, uh, umbilical tape uh, ligation with pressure also. So ble bleeding, uh, no bleeding uh, from uh, all sides. Patient was tolerated the surgery, then he shifted to the ICU. He kept in the ICU with uneventful uh, uh, issues. Bust of uh, evaluation, uh, left arm. He has unpalpable pulses, but hand well perfused. Got capillary refill, warm, intact sensory and motor exam. Uh, PBI was uh, 0.7. Bilateral lower limb, uh, palpable pulses with normal blood pressure. 
so post of CTA done, uh, stint uh, in place, uh, no migration, uh, no recall. After a few days, he developed the left femoral artery CDU aneurysm confirmed by ultrasound and treated uh, by compression under ultrasound. So vessels were sent to the uh, histopathology. Unfortunately, it wasn't uh, enough to uh, eval for evaluation. So most likely in this uh, case, uh, we have microfibrillar uh, proteins uh, deficiency uh, within the aortic matrix, uh, maybe deficient in patients with bicuspid aortic valve and uh, inadequate production of fibrillin 1 during valvogenesis may alter the formation of both the aortic cusp and root. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice presentation. A very good job, guys. Um, congratulations on your uh, successful case. Yeah. No, thank, well, thank you, have Simon. A rough, rough course, but you did great, finally. Well, no, um, yeah. I, I would like to, to add it was a very, very difficult case and yeah. nothing went uh, as that, we planned in the OR at all. Yeah. So when you were talking about the stitching into the aorta, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to think in the cardiac surgeons stitching in the aortic valve because I've never seen an artery tearing and breaking yeah. the way it was breaking. That left subclavian artery, it was like paper. It was horrible. Um, um, maybe the reason why endovascular is the best because imagine if you have to do bypass from subclavian to descending thoracic aorta with this kind of subclavian, I think you'll have a major problem, right? So, so the, the, the three arteries we touch, the three of them, the three of them gave us a problem. Uh, yeah. So we couldn't stitch the left subclavian artery. The per close proglad failed. And I can tell you, I think this is the first per close proglad is failing in KSNC for me. Since I'm here, I have a very maybe it's from artery good... also is very thin. Maybe from artery is thin. That is why the broker didn't hold. And and she, he developed a sudden aneurysm from a six French sheet. Yeah. And we were making very proper, uh, very proper compression there. Yeah, must have been so, a connective tissue disease. It, it, yes, yes, we were investigating a little bit on it, and most probably it is the, yeah. the suffering a morphanopathy. This is our suspicion. Yeah. But uh, he, he recovered uh, very good. Um, and the cardiac uh, guys are planning to do for him um, aortic valve replacement, uh, probably after Ramadan. Okay, that's good. Good job. Thank you. Uh, any yeah, question you. to Tanya, guys? Anybody has questions? Or anybody so may, I make, different may, I just make a, may I just make a comment, actually? Yes. Um, uh, two very quick comments. First of all, I, I want to thank Zahra. Um, Zahra is a, a, a new F1. She's only been with us for three or four months. Uh, we landed this case, complex case on her last week, and she's presenting it to an international audience at very short notice. So well done, and you've done very well there. The second thing is that, um, um, I mean, I hold up my hand because I was the one pushing for the carotical subclavian bypass, and I was the one who was unable to get the, the anastomosis. It was just postage stamping off twice. And we were stuck and caught. Uh, I was caught with my pants down a bit because I didn't anticipate that there might be an arteriopathy. Um, and in the end, he didn't need the carotical subclavian. Um, my logic for doing it was that one, it's a huge subclavian stump. The left vertebral I deemed to be dominant. And I anticipated that in future he would be on cardiopulmonary non pulse star bypass. So I thought, you know, the more blood we can get going to the brain during that the less likely he was to get a stroke. Um, so he still has that bridge to cross. Um, a, a bit of a learning point, it became apparent that I was not going to be able to stitch this. So I tied off the distal end with a nylon tape, a five millimeter nylon tape, and I clamped, I had a clamp right on the subclavian distal to the huge internal mammary, which is about six millimeters and the vertebral. And I said to Tanya, I'm not gonna be able to stitch this while the stump is pulsatile. So you need to plug it for me and cover it. And then maybe with the heat taken off the stump, it might be able to take a running mattress suture, uh, which thankfully it did. So that was a bit of a stressful period of time. That's why we abandoned that and then did the rest of the procedure and then did it at the end. Um, what have I learned from that? Well, I didn't know at that time that um, you can have a 
arteriopathy with bicuspid valve and coarctation. I do now. Um, would I have done anything differently? I, I probably would not have done the carotid, attempted it. Uh, but I'm just wondering, if, uh, because Fadi has uh, a lot more experience than we have on this. Um, what do you think about that? And do you have any tips for next time on this, Fadi? Or anybody else for that matter? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go uh, quick on that just a quick comment I really really these are very challenging cases uh, uh, I uh, really uh, hats off um, uh, really looking at it and the uh, the issues that you went through are, are really scary especially possibly blow out of the subclavian stump from the aorta this is a disaster with a dead patient on the table uh, very nicely uh, well managed all the cases that we have done we didn't do any carotid subclavian bypass but i totally understand the uh, the uh, the thinking process uh, maybe every time we consider if we need to do it maybe we will do it uh, after the procedure if we need it we never had to do it but i totally understand the uh, the thinking process of uh, trying to do that uh, the other thing is a uh, is a just a uh, uh, funny thing. You always do a complex groin, and you do a small sheet for angiogram on the other side, four French or five French, and you do very well with the complex groin, and your problem happens on the small sheet. So this is I uh, I, I really uh, <laughs> uh, I really appreciate what you went through, and it's really uh, frustrating. Yeah, very nice case, very challenging case. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, I think for the time seeking, we need to move to the second case. Uh, Michelle, uh, is your slides ready or you still have technical issue? Uh, hi, uh, I will try to share my screen. If it, okay, uh, I think it's uh, working now. Okay, let's share. Yeah, okay, now it's working, great. We, we can see your slide now. Okay, so let's start from the beginning and... Uh, okay. Okay, do you see my presentation, my, mm -hmm. my slides? Yeah, yeah. It's very clear. Okay. Very clear. So, thank you, Tanya, Isam, and Zahra for sharing the nice case of the coarctation. It was a nice case, uh, complicated, but uh, we have to learn from uh, complications. Uh, my presentation uh, is about uh, celiac artery and uh, SMA aneurysm. It's about a 50 years old female social smoker uh, who was known to have hypertension and dyslipidemia, well controlled on medications. She has a history of uh, severe epigastric pain four months prior to presentation. It was associated with nausea, postprandial abdominal pain, and she was diagnosed with mesenteric ischemia in a peripheral hospital. We don't have um, uh, that evidence from her CT scan, but uh, she was started already uh, on Pradaxa 150 milligrams BID since uh, this accident. And she presented to our clinic to follow up with vascular surgery. Uh, she reports decrease in her epigastric pain uh, and uh, uh, but uh, pain still aggravated the post eating. We repeated the CT scan and angio scan, which showed a 1.9 by 0 0.6 centimeter celiac artery aneurysm with a 0 0.8 centimeter neck. And a concomitant small secular SMA aneurysm was noted 0 0.5 by 0 0.6 centimeters. So this is a, a uh, celiac artery aneurysm. You can see it clearly on uh, this uh, profile picture. And we can already note the uh, acute angle between the celiac artery, the SMA, and the aortic, uh, uh, and the aorta. This is an angiography uh, uh, demonstration. And we see the hepatic artery, which takes off uh, soon after the neck of the aneurysm. And we have a discrepancy between the celiac artery uh, proximal to the aneurysm and the artery distal to the aneurysm. So, uh, Michel, is it a true or false aneurysm? I'm confused. Uh, true no, it was a, 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 a true aneurysm. True aneurysm, OK. 
there, there was no history of trauma or whatever okay. which uh, explains because you talk the, about a neck it's just small neck so i thought it was a pseudo aneurysm so it's no, a true it's, aneurysm it's, it's a true aneurysm. another true aneurysm but a small one mm. at the level of the sma 0.6 by 0.5 um, now we were not sure if uh, uh, these two aneurysm or one of these aneurysm has to do with the symptoms of the patient, uh, but we uh, so we have uh, we had a few questions. If there is any indication to treat uh, this aneurysm, one or both aneurysm, which one to start with? If we decide to treat both aneurysms, and what about the technique? So if we, uh, um, if we check the uh, Society for Vascular Surgery uh, guidelines, they recommend to treat uh, for, that, uh, for the celiac artery aneurysm, they recommend to treat any celiac artery through aneurysm more than two centimeters, which demonstrate, uh, demonstrates an increase in size and uh, with associated symptoms in patients with acceptable risk because of the risk of rupture. So, uh, we discussed uh, uh, the issue with the uh, and the treatment options with the patient, and we opted for endovascular coiling and possible standing for the celiac artery aneurysm, which was uh, the bigger one, and uh, the shape was really, um, uh, yeah, uh, it was different. It was uh, it has a, a big neck and a long aneurysm. We saw that uh, the risk of rupture here uh, here is, is very high. Uh, so what about endovascular options? We had to think about uh, either, either stent grafting uh, by exclusion by stent graft or embolization. Stent graft exclusion was discarded in our opinion. Uh, due first to limited distal landing zone, close proximity of the hepatic artery to the aneurysm neck uh, because of the difference in sizes between the proximal and distal segments of the celiac artery and uh, because of the acute angle of the celiac artery that would have required axillary artery access with subsequent need of a large size introducer. So in our case, uh, uh, the aneurysm measured 1.9 by 0 0.6 with a wide neck. We opted for primary coiling. We went from the right common femoral artery for coiling, but we were unable to achieve adequate coil compaction and we were also concerned about coil migration into the arterial lumen. So we decided to place a bare metal stent using the jailing technique to insert more coils. So this is the first uh, tentative of uh, placing. We were able to uh, deliver two coils, but uh, uh, the compaction was not complete and as you can see, we have a, a, a coil that were really protruding into the lumen. So we went from the axillary, so from the left, axi left axillary artery, and we delivered a, a balloon expandable stent, seven by twenty-six. Uh, uncovered. No, it's no. It, it was a bare metal stent. Uh, a bare metal stent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we went uh, again from the femoral side using a, a, a SIM one catheter. We were able uh, to go uh, between the struts of the stent using a micro catheter. So we went into the aneurysm again through the struts of the of the stent, and we were able to deliver one more coil. And and we were able to uh, complete a compaction uh, with complete exclusion of uh, the aneurysm. We, uh, the hepatic artery was still patent, the splenic artery and the gastric artery were all patent. So uh, we were thinking what about the, the SMA aneurysm? And if we check again the Society of Vascular Surgery guidelines, they recommend the treatment of any uh, uh, superior mesenteric artery uh, aneurysm or pseudo aneurysm, uh, even if it's a small, uh, yeah, regardless of the size, uh, the recommendation was to repair the aneurysm. But our attitude is to keep in uh, this particular patient uh, is, was to keep the patient on medical treatment, aspirin and clopidogrel, 
and do a close follow up of the SMA aneurysm, which was, uh, at our opinion, our opinion, uh, very small to treat. This is our uh, presentation. What do you think about uh, this issue? This is a small uh, summary for um, the recommendation of uh, the site of vascular surgery that we reviewed for different uh, visceral aneurysms and for the celiac and the SMA. Uh, I just uh, told you about the sizes and the recommendation to treat uh, this aneurysm. That's a nice What's slide. Your... Thanks. Thank you, Michelle, very good job. Uh, let me see what the people say about that. What do you think? Should we treat them, should not treat them? But before we go, let me ask a question. What do you think is her symptom? You still think her symptom from aneurysm or see something else? Actually, I was not convinced that uh, uh, the symptoms were uh, secondary mm -hmm. to the aneurysms. Could be, I mean, yeah. you said she has a severe angulation. Could be she has an uh, SMA syndrome because that she has severe angulation or deep angulation. I don't, I don't know how the CT looks yeah, like. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. All right, uh, who want to speak? Uh, Isam, what do you think, Isam? Yeah, I mean, it's um, a great job, Michelle. Well done. Uh, yeah. I mean, Thank when you. you showed it, I thought that probably the best way would, would be to stent it and then through the stent coil it. Um, uh, do you have any idea what the etiology was? Uh, I missed, uh, I may have missed the beginning of that. But do you know why she's making aneurysms, splinting aneurysms? We have, we have no, uh, we have no clue. But now we decided to go and uh, do a workup for uh, vasculitis or any uh, unusual etiology. But we don't uh, uh, yet. We don't have uh, yet results. We don't yeah, have I mean, I think that I think that's important in relation to the SMA aneurysm because if she has yeah. got a, an active vasculitis, you may be able to treat her with uh, with immuno immunosuppressants or things that change the natural history of this um, this SMA aneurysm. Uh, it may yeah. stay that price, yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, but, but uh, uh, the scan we performed, the last one, is free of uh, any signs of uh, vasculitis or pathology. But we we, we still have. To, to go and uh, and look for any etiology. Yeah, and uh, and with your permission, I'm going to steal this uh, this last slide. I've done a screenshot. I think it's a very good teaching slide uh, because uh, for people sure. to remember what size they treat uh, aneurysms at. Yeah, but thank you. Nice. Yeah. Lastly, does anybody have any have any experience with MFM stents? Samir, have you ever used MFM in this in this scenario? Multiflow no, modulator stents? No, 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 not really. But I think it would work fine because FMA is a small one, they work very well. Uh, so I think they work very well, you know, in this area. Um, but I did not use them. The problem they are stiff. I tried one time to use them the splenic artery, but it was very difficult because it's stiff and you know, splenic artery is very tortuous. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult really. Um, I saw one comment. We have used flow modulator stents in those uh, situations. We have used them in renal artery aneurysm. We have used them in splenic artery aneurysms. Uh, I must say, it's not a very rosy or uh, every time successful story. And one of the splenic artery aneurysms that we treated with a very expensive flow modulator stent end up being like a plug. And we wish that we had used a 50 times cheaper uh, plug to occlude completely the splenic artery than to use the flow modulator stand. But we have used it in renal and in spleen. When they work, they work well. And we have aneurysms that are shrinking actually now without even coiling, just on flow modulator stand. Extremely expensive, but we're not sure whether it's the right thing to do or not. Um, for the, this particular case, I think for Michelle, very nice case. I agree totally not to touch the SMA aneurysm at this point, very small. And if God forbid something happened to the celiac because you still have a stent now in the celiac artery at the bifurcation, then you'll end up with two arteries that have uh, active problems. I think sleep tight on that. 
and then uh, you will see over the progression what happened to the SMA. So I agree totally with the uh, with the management, except that I would have done everything through the brachial approach rather than uh, starting from the femoral. Uh, the other comment is Behcet disease. One should think seriously about Behcet disease in this patient uh, because we are uh, endemic for the Behcet disease in our region. And maybe this would be the closest uh, diagnosis to think about. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with you, Fadi, about uh, Behzet. Uh, we are uh, doing the work up now. But regarding the brachial access, actually, I was starting by doing the brachial access, but I, I found out that the uh, uh, brachial artery measured 0 0.3 uh, centimeters. It was very small. So we went to the axillary. It was like 0 0.5, not very, very, very big artery. So that's why. I hesitated and uh, I don't, uh, and I didn't want to, to do a cut down or use a big, uh, 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 you know, uh, French introducer. That's why I went from the femoral, but I was about to puncture the brachial before turning and going down to the femoral because it was very, a very small artery. Clear, noted. Thank you. Uh, Tanya, your hand is up. Do you have any question, Tanya? Yes, uh, it was regarding a technical uh, thing. Um, so I agree that uh, it's better to go for this case for the, and it's a very good presentation, very good case. I um, um, agree totally with the approach of the um, uh, bare metal stent and through it putting the coils. I was just uh, wanted to ask that, uh, uh, do you think, uh, uh, um, a BBX will have make or will be a better choice than a regular covert stand, because one of the reasons you didn't want to put a covert stand was because of the mismatch of the diameters, the proximal yeah. and distal, exactly. but the, and also because of the angle, you know, because I understand with the, the such an angle you can have a migration of the the balloon stand and it is a headache. But the, yeah. the BBX is not, I mean, it's not going to move. Um, you can flare it. Uh, has anybody experience with that? I mean, I've never, I've never uh, tried on, on these steral arteries, uh, but uh, I have used it and I know, I know it's not going to migrate and I know it's very yeah, flexible. That's the problem, Tanya, is the BBX is a cover stent and you are very close to the, you know, where is, uh, you know, branches, hepatic artery and spring artery, so you may end closing, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, oh, but let, let's say, Let's say uh, it, it, we are not close to that, um, but yes. you have this problem of the angle and the and the and the sizes. I mean, I think, would you I consider use, use going for that? Use self-expandable uncovered stand. Self-expandable, they can take two different sizes, no big deal, because this is like nineteen on uh, uncovered self-expandable stand. I think this area will work much better than uh, below expandable stand. Yeah, exactly, Samuel. You're yeah. right. Uh, but the problem with the with the with the uh, self expandable is that uh, we are not sure to uh, deliver really the stent at the right location. That's why if we have branches or we have a uh, length that is not, uh, uh, يعني, we are not very uh, comfortable with the length. Maybe the self expandable is a little bit tricky. Mm. You mean you can you can get precise deployments? Yeah. Yeah. Precise. I agree with that. Yeah. 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 I'm, I mean, I'm I'm just asking because uh, I mean the the promoted balloon stents are are uh, really you have to be very careful because they can they can migrate. Um, I mean they can migrate and then you everything is spoiled. Uh, so um, I'm, uh, this is one of the things uh, when you are uh, thinking about delivering it. I mean it's making you a, a trouble. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but, reason, uh, reason but now why. I think that the technology will change. I think it will change. I mean, uh, because now we have this one, but I think we will have more balloons like this, more remounted balloons, you know? I think maybe we, our indications will, will change also. Okay. Mm. I agree. Um, Ayman, Ayman, I didn't hear your voice today, Dr. Ayman Fakhri. Uh, what do you think about this case or the case before? Because uh, I'm still in the OR. Ah, and, sorry. Uh, so but uh, I was li uh, listening. It was a very in interesting case. Uh, thank you, Samar, and uh, thank you, Michelle. You presented the case uh, professionally. Thank you. Uh, uh, regarding my opinion, 
really, in uh, this particular case, I go for uh, uh, self expandable uh, covered stand. I think uh, I, I go for that. I don't like to make coils because uh, it may uh, uh, end by uh, okay. piercing uh, and it does not feel well. So I like to put a, a covered stent. It uh, works much better. And it is very difficult to, de to deploy. I agree for that. Yeah. The, the flow modulator stent is uh, marvelous, but it is not uh, easy procedure at all and very expensive. I think uh, the covered stent much better and gives a better result. But I, I, I think it is better to deal with the uh, SME. I don't like to leave it uh, such like that. Although it's small, I go for fixing the that too. But I agree with Fadi. You don't want to stand into major arteries, you know, because you know all this stand they have a problem in the futures. You know, I don't know how the older patient, but I think she's young patient. Uh, I'll be reluctant to use SMA. At least, as Fadi said, if something happened to the celiac, at least you have an SMA is open. Uh, uh, yeah. stand and then get to trouble. Then I think uh, I think better to be safe than sorry, you know. May, uh, maybe all right, uh, but I have to put in mind and I have to go to fix it uh, very soon because uh, it's much more problematic, uh, in my opinion. I mean, he can do a CT scan follow up and see how it yeah. increases in size. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different story, you know, to increase in size. Yeah. But I've been mean, yeah. a lot of uh, visceral aneurysms in our clinic, and the majority really stay stable. Uh, very few they increase in size. I mean, this over years. Uh -huh. uh, all right, great. Um, Ali, Ali, Ali Nahas, uh, Muhammad, uh, Ali, Dr. Ali, uh, from Syria. Yeah. What do you think, I'm Ali? Uh, yeah. You heard both cases. Any comment from any this case, this case or case before? Uh, what do you uh, think? Uh, regarding, regarding regarding the case before, hmm? I think uh, you mentioned. A, you you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. You hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Regarding the case before, I think that you mentioned a very important point that. Yeah. Uh, here we have not only the correlation, but we have also the uh, the uh, heart problem, uh, the valvular problem. So uh, my question was, uh, how was uh, the the uh, the patient after you stented uh, the correlation? Uh, you mentioned a very very important problem that. Uh, how was uh, what was the compensation of the heart? I would like to ask uh, Dr. Tanya. Does it uh, did it yeah. compensate it well or not? Yeah, yeah. The, this is something when you drop the and... when you when you drop the pressure. <laughs> yeah. The, the when first we... question. The second question, uh, uh, if you please. The second was the patient has any steel syndrome after uh, that or no? Okay. So. The second question, very easy. Thanks to God, he doesn't have a steel syndrome. The arm is compensated. Any steel syndrome, yeah. Any steel no. syndrome uh, because no, you no, indicated no. the, the subclavian, no. No, yes. he doesn't have, uh, he's asymptomatic. Uh, regarding the, the other question, we thought we talked about that. And the cardiac team was there as back backup in case the patient was crashing. Mm. The perfusion is everybody was ready. But uh, once we did the... The, the, the gradient, I mean, the, the delivery of the stent, um, the patient was doing well. He went to the ICU and he was tolerating well. Uh, they repeated, I mean, he, he, he was a little bit uh, overloaded with fluids. Um, he was a couple of days with last six infusion, uh, but after that, he was tolerating well. So, but it is, it is you, a very important you think about, about sequential dilatation in order to, uh, to permit the heart to compensate this drop. Well, in this particular to do, case, to do that. yeah, we, we, unfortunately, we, we have another uh, difficulty. The patient was uh, from Yemen, and this patient was yeah. an NSB. So he, he received the treatment, but he received the treatment because it was done as an emergency. So we were not able, yeah. or we were afraid of not to be able to provide him uh, following surgeries, okay? Maybe the ministry was denying to him the treatment. So we wanted to provide him uh, a treatment that was durable, okay? Uh, 
this yep. was a, a, a this was something that we discussed. And regarding the gradient we wanted to achieve, so some people is uh, trying to achieve 30 millimeters of gradient. Some people is claiming 20, less than 20, and some people is claiming like less than 10 millimeters of uh, gradient. I have to say that we deployed the stent up to uh, two bars, okay? Uh, we were feeling uh, the stent was not, uh, was not dilating more. There was resistance. So it was about 15 millimeters. So we were, we, uh, the, 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 the lumen of the stenosis was 4.5 and we dilated up to 15, I believe. Uh, and we, we made the first uh, uh, measure of the gradient and we were very happy because it was less than 10. So we stopped. We yeah. stopped. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. The may, second may case. I, yeah. May, may I just add, sorry to yeah. that. Um, Go ahead. That's uh, an important point here. Um, this is again for, for, for the fellows. Um, the aortic stenosis was deemed to be not as bad as uh, the echo suggested. The surface area of the valve was about a centimeter squared. Um, now what's interesting is, is what's going to happen to the aortic regurg. If the aortic regurg is due to a very high afterload, then you'd expect it to improve after you release uh, the, uh, the afterload. If it's due to a structural valve problem, then you'd expect it to worsen due to the uh, increased aortic impedance and diastolic back pressure. Now, in his case, the aortic regurg got worse um, on the subsequent echo, which suggested that this was more of a structural valvular problem rather than uh, the uh, the afterload. Functional one. Yeah, uh, than a functional one. Yeah. So 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 um, we spent a lot of time thinking and talking about this with the cardiologists, they were very confident that he would tolerate treatment of the coarctation. And, and in the end, they turned out to be right. I mean, he did uh, get a bit wet post-op and they had to give him some Lasix, but uh, it wasn't anything, uh, you know, too worrying. Um, uh, so I think they, you know, the message there is talk a lot, speak to the experts. Uh, the cardiac surgeons were standby in case he crashed. Uh, after the dilatation, in which case we were going to put a, a balloon into the aorta and, and get them to open his chest and, and, and replace the valve. But uh, thankfully, that didn't come to fruition. Great. Yeah. The second case, I think it's a uh, it very important case. Uh, uh, we, we see many visceral aneurysms, really. Last week, I did uh, a 17 years uh, old male with, with uh, Ehlers Danlos syndrome with a pseudo aneurysm of the uh, SMA, and I treated with cover stent. Uh, I had another case, uh, I discussed it with uh, Dr. Samer. Uh, it was a pseudo aneurysm of the hepatic artery. Uh, I'm thinking what I have to do. We discussed it with, uh, with Samer, but uh, it's a very, very huge pseudo aneurysm. Uh, I think Dr. Fadi treated very well this, uh, has treated very well this case. Thank you. Dr. Michel, sorry. Thank you. Thank, you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much, guys. Very nice cases. Uh, should we stop or I have a very quick short case. Should I present it or guys you want to stop? It's been an hour. No, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Should, my case should be I... quick. I mean, it'll be quick. I, I am what very quick with my cases, time? you know? Yeah, not a very uh, quick question before yes. we go on. Yes. We, is there ever a role for open surgery in these splanchnic artery, non-ruptured splanchnic artery aneurysms? Um, and if there is, what is that role? Or have we killed the open operation with your catheters and stents and all these fancy gizmos? <laughs> Not really, I think we kill it because I have a patient who came with a ruptured splanchnic artery aneurysm and we did it in the vascular, you know, even with the ruptures, you know? So I don't think surgery has any rules now, you know, with all tools we have, you know? Uh, but really, we have to do sorry for this kind of aneurysm. Unless, like, huge aneurysm, I think uh, Ali Nahas, yeah, the Ali he has in Syria, he showed me huge uh, hepatic artery aneurysms, you know. Uh, but I think, yeah, the vascular killed the surgery. Yeah. All right, let me see if I can find my presentation very quick, guys. Uh, let me go this one, this one. Here we are. Samer, meanwhile, uh, Manchester United 2-0 uh, with Paris Saint-Germain. Huh? Really? <laughs> yeah. No, sorry, sorry. Manchester City, please. Manchester City. City. Manchester yeah, City. Be careful. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, sorry, Sam. Man 
Don't uh, you ever mistake I, I know that you are a fan of Manchester United, Manchester City. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm rooting for Paris Saint Germain. Like, in unfortunately, uh, no, no. Like, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, you are out now. All right. Uh, you see my screen, guys? Uh, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Okay, that's good. So this is a late presentation of Impalize ESD occluder device. Um, uh, we have a 41 years old female who has a large ESD, about 28 millimeter. So what happened, the cardiologist, they took her and they did uh, the percutaneous closure using the Amplance Arterial Septal Occluder Device, ESOD, of 32. So what size was, they oversized it. The problem is that two months after she had it, she had a kind of her symptoms, but she did not come back to the cardiologist. You know, She decided just to stay home. After one year, she went back to them with the symptoms. When, they, when she came with the symptoms, the first thing they did a trans thoracic echocardiogram and they found there's no ESD device. It's already migrated. So they sent her for CT angiogram and it's the CSD, they found the ESD migrate all the way to abdominal aorta and sitting just above the celiac arch trunk. But patient has no symptom completely, she is symptomatic. She has no vascular symptom, no abdominal pain, nothing. And if you look, I'm oh, sorry, let's go back, leave us here. This is a CT scan and you can see the device sitting like that here, like a curve, taking the curve of the aorta. And just above the, uh, you see how sitting here, exactly at the back of the aorta and just above the, uh, exactly at the origin of the celiac artery. I don't know if you have more images here, you can see the celiac artery here and SMA, but both are patent, you know? And they're sitting in the back of the aorta. So it's taking the shape of the aorta and it's not causing any symptoms. Um, so she has no symptoms and she's completely asymptomatic. They told her that she need to be taken out by percutaneously, but she refused. And she said, no, I have no symptoms, just leave it there. And they put on warfarin just to be on safe side. And after that, she got pregnant. And unfortunately, and really she was lucky that her pregnancy was really uneventful except for some shortness of breath and leg edema. But they sent her for another year. Uh, of course, she continued to have her cardiac symptoms. So she went back to the cardiology. It's been now two years since the embolize of the ESD. So they repeat the CT scan and they scan same things, exactly the same. The device still in place, no, no, no thrombosis, both celiac SMA are open and nothing there, you know? Uh, at that time, they said her that she need to have it removed. They want to remove this one before they fix her heart. So they send it to us. So when she came to us, it's been now the ESD, the device being there about two years. So we said, okay, we can try to take it out. Let's go percutaneously, you know? Uh, so I went there, I bought a six French cheese, long cheese from Medtronic with adjustable head. You know, the one I use for indoor anchors because I can move the head so I can close to the, the, the uh, device and kind of hold it, you know? And I tried to retrieve it by using tri balloon and endovascular like here, try to tri balloon. You can cut, capture it, but you cannot pull it down. Then I put a big endovascular grasper and I grasp it there. And when you grasp it, you can see it, it comes down. So the picture is not very clear, but the moment I let it go, it goes up. So it's really stuck to the abdominal of the aorta. So even I can grab it, but when I pull it down, it goes down. When I let it go, it goes to jump up the way it was before. So that means already endocellularized with the abdominal wall and it's part, become part of the abdominal wall. So I'm afraid that if I continue pulling, I will end with the ruptures. So, sorry, where we are now. So we decided, um, where is that now, sorry. I'll finish here, okay. So we told her that she need to be taken by uh, surgery, uh, but she refused. And she said, no, I have no symptom, nothing, I'll leave it alone. So we left her alone. We went on warfarin for a year because we don't know what to do. But after that, I said, it's too much, you know? So I switched her to the aspirin and blotix. As being follow, being follow, following, following us with us for about two more years now. So it's been almost like five years since she had it. And every time every year she come or beat a CAT scan and exactly the same pictures, no complications, nothing. So it's, I just leave it like that. It's like when we do like, a, like when you put stent in the water all the time, like T-VAR, E-VAR. So I said to myself, why well, just consider like an E-VAR or T-VAR? Just like leave it there, it's there. It's, it's taking the control of the water. 
because surgery is a major surgery because you know it's a supraceliac. That means you have, and especially now it's engorged in the uh, wall of the aorta. So that means you have to open the aorta and you have to do a muscle like, you know, uh, maybe thoracoabdomen, a lower thoracoabdomen incision to get it out. So we decided to leave it, on, uh, leave it there. And we've been follow up now for the last two years. So now be five years and everything's fine. So what do you think guys? Is this the right decision or we should go and take it out? I will leave it. So you agree, just leave it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, usually, I mean, if you uh, try to look at literature, the problem is literature, all of them is done like within like a couple months and they go and take them in the vascular. I didn't see any case which came after like two, three years, you know, because most of them, they discovered early because patients, they get a heart symptom right away. So like right away, like next couple of days or maximum after like a month or two. So they have no time for endothelialization. So it's very easy to remove it. And we have a case which we removed in the vascular uh, before, but was like within a week, you know? Uh, but this is the first time I see a case like that where it goes for years, you know? So I don't know if somebody has different opinion or what you think else. Yes, please. Uh, I, I vote for leave it. But when I decide to remove it, I don't like to remove it uh, endovascularly. I like to remove it surgically. Even, I have, uh, even if it comes out early? Why is this sound? Uh, no, no, if it comes early, it's okay. Uh, this is uh, 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 no doubt it comes early. I, I get it uh, endovascular. But in such cases of chronic cases, I don't like to try to get it uh, endovascular. Yeah. Uh, I have a scenario, something like that, but a little bit different. Uh, I have a case of uh, IBC filter embedded in the aorta and migrated and tilted at the by, uh, bifurcation of both common iliacs. What to do? I mean, I tell you, if it's done in the abdominal aorta, I mean, I will take it out, no problem. I mean, the only my problem here is because it's uh, very high, but if it's lower in the lower abdominal or close to bifurcation, I, I will go and take it out uh, because an easy approach uh, and you can solve your issue forever. But this one, I'm reluctant because of position. Yeah, yeah. you have a point. Yeah. You have a point. Yeah. Leave it, but if you, uh, if you have to do, open it. Yeah, Adam Samir. Uh, yes, so. When you pull on, when you pull on the sheath, and the patient moves down the table with you. <laughs> you, you <laughs> I'm saying you, I was only yeah, for, yeah. for like think, a couple seconds, and then I stopped. I, think, I said I don't want to have you know rupture. I, and you can I see my that, grasp, but I was grasping, and really you tried to pull hard, hard a little bit. I sit down. I have to stop. You know. Yeah, I think Mother Nature is trying to give you a hint there, um, yeah. and and I'd leave it, and 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 quite frankly, I would stop irradiating her every year. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, maybe you, you do it every three, four, five years, something yeah, like that. I yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. What yeah. about anticoagulant? Do we need any anticoagulant? I mean, I stopped warfarin and now put on aspirin, Blavix. But I don't, even now, I think it's all the endothelized, but maybe just put on aspirin or Blavix, I think. Just just one antiplatelet would be enough. Yeah. 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 But yeah. leave it alone. Everyone agree on that. Yeah, yeah oh. I agree. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it out. Mm -mm. I'll take it out. <laughs> No, no, right. no, right. Your coronary will, will make an spasm if you try to pull from that again. Yeah. <laughs> because I mean, I thought really, we, how much how, how much we put like metal inside the aorta? We put a lot of metals, right? We do a chimney, we have T-var, E-var. So what's the big deal? I thought this considered like a T-var. What's the big deal? Leave it there. Especially if it's yeah. nice, you know, taking the curve. It's not like tilting or something <laughs> like that. It's what I like. It's it, really it, it, a nice it's, curve. It's endothelized already. Uh, yeah, you see, it taking yeah. the curve. So I said, just leave it alone and hopefully it should be. See how it took the curves of water? That's what I like about yes, it, yes. you know? So it was uh, nice. Do you think it's yeah, embedded, see, the it's covered now? Or maybe I it's think. a question of diameter, of size. That's why you couldn't pull it down. Did you try to, to push it up or when you grasped it, when you were... Uh, no, I think it's endothelized because I grasp it with a grasper and not like, and uh, not, uh, you can you can see my sheet's very close to it and I get a grasper, not like even uh, uh, a snare. Yeah. And I can't really buy, have it in my hand. I mean, my yeah. grasper, when I pull it and then when I let it go, it should 
stay in place if it's not endothelized, but it just jumped exactly where it was before. Like I pulled down like two centimeters and then when I let the gas bar go, it just jumped up exactly where it was before. So this tell me it's endothelized, you know, otherwise yeah. it would be moved a little bit and did not move mm -hmm. at all, not even a millimeters. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's endothelized, yeah. Yeah, I think should leave it. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys, great. Thank you, sorry I kept you late today. Thank you guys very much. Enjoy the rest of the night and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. 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 Thank